I'll click the record button. So you this may, meeting is being recorded. You may begin. That's good. Um, so my name is Benjamin Acord, but um, I mainly go by Kyle. Sorry, I've never told you. Um, and I did Trifles by Susan Glassfell. Um, just some like background knowledge on Susan. Her full name is Susan Keating Glassfell. She was born on July 1st, 1876. She was an American playwright, novelist, journalist, and actress. And she has written nine novels, 15 plays, and a biography. And some of her plays include Trifles, Close the Book, Bernice, and Verge. Um, some history on Trifles. Um, it was published in 1916. I couldn't find the exact date for it. I looked, but I, I couldn't. Um, it was first performed on August 8th, 1916. Um, the first performance was done by the Provincetown Players at the Wharf Theater in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And in the original performance, um, Susan Glassell played one of her characters, uh, Miss Hale. Um, so like background on like the actual play, it's based off of the true story. Um, she worked as a reporter at the Des Moines New, Des Moines, yeah, okay. And covered the murder trial of the farmer's wife, Margaret Hossack in Indianola, Iowa. Um, Margaret claimed to be asleep while someone came to her house, like broke in and murdered her husband with an ax right beside her. And um, a quote from Susan is, um, though past 50 years of age, she is tall and powerful and looks like she would be dangerous if aroused to the point of hatred. And that came from her report that she did for the news. Um, some background on the feminist movement. Um, women back then, like the 1900s, they were expected to be married and have children. And usually if you like weren't, you were like kind of looked down upon. And um, if you were single, you usually had to like, get a service job to support yourself, like waitressing, cooking, cleaning, etc. cetera. Um, in the 1910s, women were fighting for the right to vote. And they actually got that in 1920. So hurrah. Um, there are four ways of feminism and the first wave was from 1848 to 1920 um that was about women getting basic rights such as reproductive rights voting etc but it excluded anyone that wasn't a white woman pretty much which came back to haunt them in the future um the second wave was in was from the 60s to the 70s and that challenged women's roles in society um they didn't want to just be um, housewives and they wanted like more rights. So Roe v. Wade was passed and the Equal Pay Act was passed within those 10 years. Um, it, it didn't go through though. It didn't go. Th yeah, I think, yeah. It, I think it passed um, one of the houses of Congress, but it didn't become a law. I do know that. Yeah. Um, the third wave was in the 90s. And um, it was about women having their own identity. Um, they were more open with their sexuality, um, being more individuals, and they were being rebellious. And the fourth wave is actually like, we're currently in the fourth wave right now. And it's about um, being open to all types of like women, so like trans women, black women, um, women of color, any like anyone that identifies as a woman pretty much. Um, a little summary on the play. It's a satirical comedy that makes fun of the gender norms in the 1900s. And um, Mrs. Wright, she's being held in jail for the murder of her husband, John Wright. And um, George Henderson, the county attorney, Henry Peters, the local sheriff, um, go to the house, look for any, any evidence of like what happened, what if someone broke in or if it was her um and they bring mrs hale and mrs peters to gather things for mrs Wright, like clothes anything that she would need in jail um the men make fun of the women um, for worrying about broken jars of preservatives and say women are used to worrying over trifles and um the women they um find this quilt and it had been being worked on like they found patches of it and one of the patches were like really like messy. So they decided to fix it for her. 
and they go to look for string and they find a bird cage and it had been like messed up a little bit like the door was coming off the hinges so they were kind of confused because um they didn't know she had bird and they haven't seen like any traces of a bird around besides that cage and it's not like a bird would eat it because she didn't like not like a bird not, not like a cat would eat it because she didn't like cats and um so they go through her sewing kit um more to like try to find like scissors or anything and they end up finding a box and they open the box and there's something wrapped in silk so they unwrap it and it's a bird with its neck wrung um so the women have this like back and forth of well like many right back then for many whatever um before she was married she was a very like happy person she would sing be like she was just an open person but after her marriage she became unhappy so the women assume that after that mr wright had killed the bird she killed him for like payback of everything she's went through throughout her whole entire marriage and they don't tell the um men like the county sheriff or county attorney and the local sheriff about the bird because they don't want her to like have any bad evidence bad evidence against her. Um, the theme of the play is gender differences. Um, the men, they're very like rough, self-centered, and they make fun of the women for just worrying about like small things. And they just wanted to um, find things, like they wanted the cold hard evidence, but the women could understand the mentality of why she did it and think she's innocent. Um, there's also some irony in the story because the women were able to find more evidence than the men and they searched the whole entire house and they just stayed in one room the whole entire play. I thought that was pretty neat. Here are my discussion questions. Um, should the women have told the men about the bird? Was murder the only option for Mrs. Wright? How does the setting of the play contribute to our understanding of Minnie Wright's position? And in what way does the ironic title of the play shape its meaning? Hey, uh, Professor, you're muted. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I was going to say, Ben, you can stop your share for now and um i will get back to you in a second we'll get back to those questions you gave us okay want to go to wait what is it sorry here in a second i'll have you pull those questions up again so we can revisit them once we've talked for a few minutes so be ready to share again okay um, so yeah, very good introduction to the play, Ben. Very good. So um, let's start out with general impressions. This is a this is a really short play, only ten pages. Uh, it's a one act play, so this is definitely something new as far as what we've been doing. Tartuffe and Shakespeare were all five act plays. This one's only a one act play, so that's that is something to comment on. Um, if I was going to add a few things to Ben's presentation, I would probably mention we're now moving into kind of, so we kind of jumped ahead a little bit. We skipped the Tartuffe was written in the 1600s, so. We skipped quite a bit of history as far as innovations within the within the theater. I can talk a bit about that just to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, 1660s, and as far as England goes, was the first time that women were allowed to perform on the stage. So that was definitely a new innovation all that stuff with shakespeare we read 
it was boys playing women parts little like sort of androgynous boys playing women parts so throughout some of this history that we've kind of skimmed over and now women are allowed to perform on the stage and of course lots of stuff has happened historically once we have had the american revolution the french revolution um, those are two of the major events that of course the industrial revolution so we kind of we're kind of jumping ahead quite a bit the fact that we lost uh, the importance of being earnest we kind of um, we lost that sort of victorian era play there's lots of different literary movements that have happened during, that have happened during this span of time um, we have what's called the Enlightenment. We talked about the Enlightenment with Artouf. We skipped, we kind of skimmed over the Romantic period of literature. And um, yeah, mostly the Romantics. And now we're kind of moving into the more modern age of literature. So, uh, frankly, uh, frankly, I didn't have you guys read too many. Uh, 18 or 1900 or sort of 17 1800s era plays just frankly because i'm not that much of an expert on them and that's something that i frankly need to educate myself more on i'm a scholar of 1800s american lit but uh, even in my own research i've never really studied a lot of drama so up until the 1900s my, my knowledge picks back up in the 1900s so uh, susan glaspell's trifles susan glaspell was seen as one of the great american dramatists of her age and ben was right to point out that she is um, also a well-known journalist lots of lots of writers in this time period also were journalists um, jack london was another was another Frank Morris. Lots of good American writers were journalists. So they kind of Theodore Dreiser. A lot of these writers in the late 1800s, early 1900s, sort of took inspiration from stuff that they saw, kind of fictionalized it. Um, but we're moving into the modern age. With the modern age, um, the modern age, there was a movement called modernism. Modernism. And um, what, a lot of what modernism tries to do, and this is something, whenever we talk about fences in a few minutes, fences is kind of a postmodern play. Whenever we study uh, Death of a Salesman after break, that's more of a modernist play. Trifles is kind of a modernist play. But um, what modernist writings often tried to do they would try to experiment with literary form. So, for instance, Shakespeare was a five act play. This is just a one act play. So, this was kind of a, an innovation, a major innovation. Nobody had ever done anything like this before. So, um, you had this sort of um, experimentation with how you tell stories instead of there being exposition like this this play is kind of almost like a murder mystery like if you go to a dinner theater murder mystery that's kind of like what this play is so that's kind of a nice sort of play on typical dramatic structure i think all of you guys would probably agree when i say this play is a lot different than anything we've read so far um as we as we're kind of moving closer to the modern period and uh, as ben said as well this play is also known as a great piece of feminist literature um, probably this for this time period late 18 early 1900s this and the yellow wallpaper uh, the yellow wallpaper is a short story but both of those uh, texts are probably the more most iconic Probably Kate Chopin's novella, The Awakening, is probably another example. 
great not great great new railroad. But um, you know, that's probably another example of great feminist literature from this time period. This one's not so overt. This one's kind of more of a dry, satirical book. Um, one other thing to mention, of course, is the play. The play, even though it's kind of witty and satirical, it's also very much um, there's very there's a lot going on under the surface, including what happened with Mrs. Wright and Mr. Wright. What happened for Mrs. Wright to, to murder her husband the way that she did? Of course, Ben kind of gave you the clue with. Uh, she doesn't spell it out for you. But ben kind of gave you the clue with the bird with its neck twisted. Right? Maybe Mr. Wright was kind of, uh, that, that's kind of ironic. That's kind of an ironic name, right? Mr. Wright. <laughs> but um, we kind of get a clue. Maybe he didn't treat her too well. There's lots of abuse in that, in that marriage. So. Um, yeah, let's let's kind of get some general thoughts, general impressions. What did Savannah? You know, I'm gonna you know I was gonna pick on you probably first, right? Because you are our resident uh, uh, feminist in the in the classroom, right? So uh, I want to pick on you first. What did you think of this one? Of course, you would, mm -hmm. because as soon as anything feminist, I'm up first, but. <laughs> Um, honestly, I didn't hate this because it, it was funny to me in a way because it, the ironic part of it is like the girls are so smart, or at least the version that I had read and watched and what have you. <clears throat> there was a play, I think it was done by university and it was two really elderly women and then a younger man and an older gentleman and I think the farmer but they the play they did they showed I don't think Ben got to talk about it but um basically them going through the quilts I know he had talked about they found the bird but in the play that I watched, it was it was the bird, yes, and same as that. But they was making fun of the women for going through the cloth and going through the quilts. And basically, whenever they was gathering stuff for the woman and what have you, they gave the quilts to her, even though they was a clear sign of she was just doing it out of fret they talked about how she had sewed a certain way and you can see in part of it the one that she was working on whenever the police was talking with her it was jagged and wasn't sewn right and you could clearly tell there were some mistakes but <clears throat> i just found this play funny overall just for the fact of it just it kind of plays the whole, oh, yeah, men think they're so smart, but they don't look for the details in it. So I enjoyed it. Right. The, a man's eye and a woman's eye are a bit different, right, with how we perhaps view, view things. I think, like, um, these two men kind of seem like overly analytical, like Sherlock Holmes or something, right? where it, it takes a couple of, they just kind of completely skirt it over it takes a couple of women to be able to kind of see and unravel this this mystery yeah very very good savannah the i think you were right to point out that whole thing with the quilt once they saw how uneven the quilt was they kind of maybe saw that uh, she was in a sort of frazzled state of mind. Okay, well, good. What about some of the rest of you guys? Um, Josh, what did you make of this one? Hmm. Uh, I 
Mm, I have kind of mixed feelings about this play, have, especially after uh, going through fences, which I really enjoyed, by the way. Uh, hmm. I, I, I don't, I don't really have anything to add. Uh, yeah. I, I, I yeah. Well, I'll ask you. I'll ask you this question, Josh. What do you think about how short it was? It's a little weird, you know, considering what we've already what we've already read through. I've, I've we've usually had to uh, read through pay multiple dozens of pages, and now it's just you know, oh, it's really short. Uh, that that one was kind of shock, a little bit shocked. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of. I thought it was kind of refreshing yeah, after reading all the Shakespeare and Tartuffe and all the stuff we've read. Just how fast it it, re it reads. Um, uh huh. I agree. Well, uh, Michelle, we haven't we haven't heard from you in quite a while. I'm glad to see you back. What did you think of of this one? I agree with basically everything that savannah said about the men and about the quilt because you know men back then and maybe some men now their their attitudes are just like ah oh, i'm a man i know everything what do women know they're women they cook they clean what else do they know how to do but in all honesty women know everything and the quilt really does, it really did represent her mind and what she was going through. I think, I think that's very well said. Um, yeah, you know, it kind of reminds me of like jokes old men will make, right? Even today, they're like, ha ha ha, those silly women over there. They're always nagging us. Right? That's, that's kind of what the, the two men in the play remind me of like uh like it's like if you go to church and you have the old men club and they're all they're all complaining about their wives i that, that's kind of um that's kind of the best way i know to put it that's kind of what these men in the play remind me of like you women you just you just think about silly stuff. You think about your silly trifles. That, that's how what the, of course that line is what the play is named after. Um, Savannah, you know the exact type of old man I'm talking about. You quite literally described my grandfather for the fact <laughs> of he goes to a place near where we live called West Madison Grocery every single morning. Tom, as always, and he's on with the mayor and friends of the community. Like a, how would you describe it? I think like a um, football team or preppy team or something in high school, like the make fun of kids. Mm. So that was kind of his uh, his thing when he was younger. Yes. <laughs> so now he and the other old men are always joking about how the how their women keep them down. If my grandmother was still alive to this day, he would say that she is nothing. I quote, but an old bitch. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> like they hated each other but loved each other at the same time. My grandmother was a hell of a woman. And he will even tell you that. Yeah, I've, I've seen several. That sounds, that sounds like my parents, actually. Yeah, that's, that kind of sounds like my parents. Yeah. And you, you guys all know the types, the type of the types that all like hang out at Hardee's for like six hours a day in the morning. You know, you, get, you guys. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about, but this was this is more of a characteristic of older men now. But um, we can kind of discuss: do 
even younger men have these stereotypes. The some young and men even kind of have these stereotypes, just being very dismissive of women. We always, one of the um, big talking, uh, one big talking point, even in like memes and stuff, is how some men, um, what what do they call? I'm, I'm drawing my brain's working slow today. What's that when um, a man tries to explain something simple to a woman? What's that called? Mansplaining. Yeah, mansplaining, right? So um, a, a lot of what um, these guys in this play are doing is kind of like mansplaining. Okay. Do, do you guys, do you ladies in here feel like you've been mansplained a lot? Yes, absolutely. Like I call a lot of guys out for mansplaining too. Uh, like what kind of stuff have you been mansplained about? I think my favorite is mansplaining on how to like either play a video game or mansplaining on like how to work on basic things on your car, like how to change a tire, how to change your oil. My grandfather is the worst for it because the first time he ever got really sick he wanted me to change his oil and his lawnmower well I knew how to do it and I even told him I knew how to do it he said all right how about this I tell you how to do it I'll give you a rough summary and you go do it if you mess it up you pay for it to get fixed I said all right no problem he sat there and mansplained every single detail but forgot a good detail of you need a um filter wrench sometimes to get that filter off because it's really tight anyways he mansplained the whole thing and I knew it anyways did it on my own did things that he never even told me about and he was like how do you know how to do that I said I've known how to change my oil since I've had a car now really it's small things like that that crack me up but it angers me so much and a lot of guys my age hate me for it because I call them out on Yeah, I saw I saw you nodding too, Michelle. Like you had some good examples. I don't really know off the top of my head. Okay. I work at an assisted living facility. I do the billing and I'm also an AMAP, which means I pass medicine. <laughs> this one guy that I work with, I've been an AMAP for like maybe like three, four months. I've been passing medicine for a really long time. I understand how to like give injections and stuff. So I'm trying to give this lady her insulin. And you know, he comes up behind me and he's like, did you take the cap off? Oh Lord. Did you take the cap off the injection? Did you dial it the right way? Did you look at the number? What do you mean? How else am I supposed to give her her insulin if I didn't take the cap off? I don't know. You just had to be there. I understand um, that for the fact that I'm also an AMAP. And it's <laughs> like one of the little twist dials that you're talking about. Oh, my yes. God. All it is is you twist it to the number and then you push it down. It's just a little nothing. Not even like a full syringe, which I've done. So I fully understand that one. Yeah. Yeah, they just act like you're too much of an imbecile to understand such a such a basic thing. Yes. Um, well, let's pick on the other ladies. Faith, what do you, what do you think about this whole thing? What the mansplaining or the play? Yeah. Uh, take take you the one. I'll do the mansplaining because this story is actually kind of funny. Um, uh, I had to use my uncle as a chauffeur for a long time, and he's a blithering idiot. So one day I told him, hey, I have to go to the doctor to talk about this uh, hormonal imbalance I got from polycystic ovary syndrome which I was producing way more testosterone to the point where I didn't even have a monthly cycle 
like it was insane and I had like all this acne and he tried to tell me um you don't produce testosterone because you're a woman you have estrogen like this man's 40 how does he not know that both sexes have both hormones yeah yeah, I, I could see where you that would probably just make you want to scream. Right? Like, how how do you explain that? Um, yeah, my my wife has that too. Um, yeah, tough. It's, it's a tough thing to manage. <laughs> yeah, I tell. Tell him he's full of estrogen. That's, that's why he gets butt hurt. So, um, well, Lily, I'll pick on you last. Um, what is, what do you think about this whole conversation? Have you been mansplained? I'm sure I have some more in my <laughs> life. Uh, I think it's funny when they try to tell you how to drive or either cook. Yeah, <laughs> like you really don't know how to do it, but I think it's really funny. Yeah, there's all the old cliche jokes about how women can't drive and all that stuff. Well, Meanwhile, women's women, insurance is higher than women. Very true, very true. Especially for younger women like teenagers, like teenage boys, their insurance is out of the world. Feels like mine hasn't gone down much over the years either. So, uh, yeah, actually it's shot up a bunch recently. They, they, they blame inflation for it. You know, you're an insurance company. You literally collect money to do nothing. So, like how how is it inflation? You know, these kind of things have what made me lose my hair over the years. But um, well, let me ask you guys this: we'll we'll talk about this one for a few more minutes, and then we'll move on to fences because I think fences is definitely more of the that's definitely our main play for them. I think that's the beefier one, but. Um, what did you guys think of this whole like, murder mystery thing going on? She was kind of like playing, she's kind of like playing, this is right, it's kind of like playing coy, right? Like, well, I'll sleep. I don't know who choked him to death. I, mean, I don't know who hung him by the neck. Um, so, and especially in how the case is solved, how simply it is solved with just a woman's gaze instead of a man's gaze um, you can kind of see this is kind of an early detective story this time period lots of great detective literature started from Edgar Allan Poe started a lot of it um, he, Edgar Allan Poe was not only a great horror writer he was also an early writer of mysteries of course we have Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock stories so this this play is definitely existing within that genre. So, um, what did you guys think of the quick mystery solving in the play? Are you are you got? So let's 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 kind of let me frame the question this way: If it was somebody. I'm sure some of you guys have seen some Sherlock Holmes stuff over the years. Maybe the BBC show or the Robert Downey movies, or maybe you've read one of the stories. Um, do you guys feel like the great detective Sherlock Holmes could have uh, solved this mystery? Or was it, was it just the fact these two particular dudes were just clueless? They was clueless. I hate to say it. If Sherlock Holmes would have really went into 
and his what his work is is he would go into their mind obviously because they're two grown men and they they are smarter than ever there's no reason to go into a woman's mind right yeah i think you're probably right savannah i think i think somebody like sherlock holmes would probably solve this pretty quickly that and i kind of feel like they disregard her as the murderer because she's just this little old lady who does her quilts and is for some reason so in shock because her husband was found dead but they're searching for the killer the killer but obviously it's not her she's just this little old lady Yeah, it's it's how um, I think this was definitely. I think you're right. I mean, I think this is definitely a play about culture, right? How culture can kind of blind us, especially then that more um, male-dominated culture, um, these attitudes about women sort of percolate down, trickle down. So. Um, Yeah, it's maybe the simplicity of the place that is the whole point right men overanalyze things and, um, it, it take maybe it takes a sim a new fresh perspective to see the truth of things so, yeah different play um, I think last year, let me take a look. I think Blasper might be the only, this is probably a bad thing on my part, but um, I think Blasper is the only female writer I, mean, or I put on the syllabus. I should probably put a couple more, but um, we've had lots of good feminist texts, like the Duchess of Malfi. And you can kind of even read something like Macbeth that's feminist if you want to read Lady Macbeth as a proto feminist character. But um, now this is definitely, I think this is our first female author. And there wasn't a, that part of that's because of the history. There just wasn't a lot because those voices were suppressed in the medieval and Renaissance and Greek periods. So the further we move closer to the present, the more we get it. Even then, I don't really know a lot of um, Carol Churchill's in her book, in our particular book, she looked her play Cloud Nines on page 1230. I had to recommend another writer in her book. Since you already have the book, I would recommend Carol Churchill. I actually did put her on the syllabus, but I cut her out at the last minute. Maybe in a future semester, I'll include her. Yeah, I know her work pretty well. Some of these other writers in here, I don't know. The good thing about the, the good thing about this book is it tries to give you a wide range of writers from a bunch of different cultures. Well, my teaching is informed by stuff I've studied in grad school and stuff. A lot of a lot of these, especially these multicultural. Um, Place some other countries, I'm, I'm just simply not familiar with it. So your teacher doesn't know everything. Yeah, usually in the 20th century, the big playwrights are um, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, who we'll read next time, Samuel Beckett. And August Wilson, August Wilson, who we get ready to talk about. Eugene O'Neill, Carol Churchill is a very respected contemporary writer. She's still alive. Susan Parks, I've heard of her. And I haven't read any of her stuff, but she's in our book too. Now, part of part of all this is I'm just much much better with the earlier stuff I think than I am with more modern stuff. But um, 
Well, let's transition now to August Wheels and Spences. So, um, August Wilson um, is a writer from Pittsburgh. He is not far, his stomping grounds is, is not far from where we live. There's actually, if you go to Pittsburgh today, you can actually go to uh, August Wilson Museum there. He act, if you guys want to, Maybe after class, if you guys want to read a good essay, um, he actually wrote a really good essay about his own play, Fences, and it immediately follows where the play is in our book, starting on page 1437. So um, he speaks. This is, his essay is really interesting. If you if you read it, he talks a lot about um, especially the role of of um, especially in America, African Americans in the theater. How even up till today, a lot of African Americans in the theater are disenfranchised. There's not there's never been a lot of um, representation. When it comes to uh, African American writers, it, not only writers but also actors, um, think about like famous Broadway actors and stuff, right? Like how how many of those were African American? Not very many. So he he kind of gives you a nice little essay um, that kind of historicizes all of that. Um, look at page 1438, 1438, and this is, this is a good quote. I want to I read this quote for you guys. Um, Wilson's kind of like uh, one, one thing that's a popular bug word in American politics today is critical race theory. I'm sure that you guys have heard heard that being used uh, negatively. A lot of conservative politicians like to paint it like it's a horrible thing. Critical race theory is pretty much this, it's, it's this new wave, especially in English studies, that um, addresses just how, just the systematic disadvantages that uh, especially African Americans have even today. So you, know, you think to yourself, okay, things like segregation aren't really happening anymore like they were back in like the 1940s, 1950s. But um, the idea of critical race theory is um, if you're not white, you, you, have, you have a lot of disadvantages. So whether it's in the job place, whether it's in something like the theater, representation and things like movies um yeah this is this is definitely a subject that comes up in movies as well like there's just simply you have to it's much harder to rise to the top i guess you could say if you are because of race than if you were uh, than if you were white frankly and a lot of um Conservative politicians think that this is just such an ugly idea and that we're race baiting and things like that. Um, not really, right? It's for me at least, it's kind of hard to argue. Like that, what oh, the evidence, I'm a logical person, the evidence seems overwhelming, right? It's, it's much harder for African Americans to thrive in our culture than it is than it is if you just simply happen to be born white that's that's uh that's the general idea of critical race theory it's um you're not saying one race is superior to the other or anything like this so there's lots of lies that are spread about this idea but wilson this essay that uh that uh, Point, pointing out he talks a lot about this kind of stuff 
if you look at the very bottom of 1438, well, um, well, I'll, I'll actually read this whole passage. I think this is a good passage. Look up to the top of the page in one guise, he says. So he's talking about like what is August Wilson, the most the most recent writer we'll read in this class at our present moment. He's talking about like where does he stand in relation to all these great playwrights? He quotes a lot of um, names we've read in here. He says, in one guise, the ground I, I stand on has been pioneered by the Greek dramatists, by Euripides, Aeschylus, and Sophocles, by William Shakespeare, by Shaw, Ibsen, and Chekhov, Eugene O'Neill, Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams. And in other guys, the, the ground that I stand on has been pioneered by my grandfather, by Nat Turner, by Denmark Vesey, by Martin Delaney, Marcus Garvey, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That is the ground of the affirmation of the value of one's being. An affirmation of his worth in the face of this society's urgent and sometimes profound denial. It was this ground as a young man coming into manhood, searching for something to dedicate my life to, that I discovered the Black Power Movement of the 60s. Felt it a duty and an honor to participate in that historic moment. As the people who had arrived in America chained and malnourished in the hold of a 350-foot Portuguese, Dutch, or English sailing ship, we were now seeking ways to alter our relationship to the society to which, in which we live. Perhaps more important, searching for ways to alter the shared expectations of ourselves as a community of people. I find it very curious, but no small accident, that I seldom hear, hear those words Black Power spoken. When mention is made of that part of Black history in America, whether in the press or in conversation, reference is made to the Civil Rights Movement as though the Black Power Movement an important social movement by America's ex-slaves had in fact never happened. The Black Power movement of the 60s was in fact the reality. It was the kiln in which I was fit, fired and has much to do with the person I am today and the ideas and attitudes that I carry as part of my consciousness. I mention this because it is difficult to disassociate my concerns with theater and the concerns of my life as a Black man. And it is difficult to disassociate one part of my life from another. I have strived to live it all seamless, art and life together, inseparable and indistinguishable. The, the ideas I discovered and embraced in my youth, when my idealism was full blown, I have not abandoned the middle age when idealism is something less than blooming, but wisdom was starting to bud. The ideas of self-determination, self-respect, and self-defense that governed my life in the 60s, I find just as valid and self-urging in 1996. The need to alter our relationship to the society and to alter the shared expectations of ourselves as a racial group, I find of greater urgency now than it was then. I am what is known, at least among the followers and supporters of the ideas of Marcus Garvey, as a race man. That is simply that I believe that race matters. That is the largest, most identifiable, and most important part of, my, of our personality. It is the largest category of identification because it is the one that most influences your perception of yourself. And it is the one to which others in the world of men may most respond. Race is also an important part of the American landscape as America is made up of an amalgamation of races from all parts of the globe. Race is also the product of a shared gene pool that allows for group identification, and it is an organizing principle around which cultures are formed. When I saw, when I say culture, I'm speaking about the behavior patterns, the arts, beliefs, institutions, and all other products of human work and thought as expressed by a particular community of people. So that was. I think, I think especially in that last paragraph, I think he said it all, right? He kind of comments on like how important race is to our understanding of ourselves and, and um, all of the sort of social constructions that we have dealing with race. That's what critical race theory is about. It's this kind of uh, study of 
how race impacts everything. And it's kind of, I'll just be frank here when I say, especially in the area in which we live, it's often hard to see this because we live in such a predominantly white um, area that it's often hard to um, wrap our minds around this around this concept, especially of how much it changes things, especially if you're not white. So um, that's kind of what Wilson's saying, like, hey, this long-standing history of drama, that's pretty much what he says in that first paragraph, this long-standing hist history of drama is all white guys, right? So, um, like, especially now, where do we find, where can we find our own voice? So, um, I think he's definitely accomplished his goal with this play, Fences, one of the great, very iconic play. And um, so I guess another way I want to frame this discussion, oftentimes when it comes to race, especially if we want to think about American society today, think about race, but also think about social class. Like um, a lot of the questions, especially surrounding the black community, is what is what is holding our particular community down more? Is it the color of our skin, or is it the fact that we're um, this? Is it the fact that we're poor? Right? Like, what? Which one is it? Is it is it a mix of both? This is a pretty controversial question in and of itself. Um, because um, some people think that it's that it's race that plays the bigger role. Some people think it's class that plays a bigger role. Maybe some, maybe it's a mix of both. This play does a lot to show, like what is what kind of things um, might be happening to kind of keep. Um, what types, not, not necessarily direct things, even like what kind of indirect things are happening to keep the black community down, to keep people from thriving and becoming and following the American dream. There's obstacles to the American dream, and that's kind of almost like what the play's about. Fences, right? The fence around the house, that's a symbol of. Um, a separation, right? A separation that's an obstacle. So, um, there's any number of ways we can dig into this play. Troy is an awesome character. Um, he's so, he's very complex. Right? He's got a lot of anger. Troy was living in the 50s, um, the 19. 30s, 40s, 50s. He said he's kind of that older generation. He was like August Wilson was born in what, what year was he born? I think August Wilson was more was a baby boomer. Yeah, Wilson was born um, 1945. Yeah, Wilson's a baby boomer. And um, the character Troy, he's kind of that greatest generation, World War II era generation. So, um, but Troy is this kind of bitter, broken down character. And um, the play is all about him, right? His relationship with his sons. Um, of course, um, Corey is the football player who kind of idolizes his dad, kind of kind of wants to, his, Corey's his stepson, though. I should, I should mention that, Corey's his stepson. Um, he's also got his son, Lines. Lines was his kid by a previous marriage. Lines is always bumming for money. Like, you kind of get this whole theme of accountability. Like, uh, he needs... Lines is always bumming. He's wanting something. He wants to be a musician. He can't. Lines can't stand the thought of uh, working a nine to five job. 
He thinks he'll slit his wrist, so he has to work a nine to five job. So he's chasing this kind of career, being a musician. Also, his relationship with Rose, his wife, is definitely a complex one. We find out that uh, Troy has some infidelities in, in the middle of the play. Um, has a baby with um, another woman. Of course, Gabriel, Gabriel's kind of a religious link. He's, of course, meant to reference the angel Gabriel. Gabriel was wounded in World War II, and uh, supposedly his head wound um, caused him to have various social problems. So Gabriel was kind of a disabled character in the play. And um, I think that's pretty much it as far as the main players. And also Jim Bono, who is uh, Troy's best bud, right? They, they kind of hang out. So um, that was a long-winded introduction to the play. Um, I had to mention this. In order to talk about this play, we got to talk about race just because it's such a big part of the play. But um, let's start getting your guys' thoughts with general impressions. Let's start with general impressions, then we'll move to character analysis. Um, Daryl, I don't think I've heard from you tonight. What, what did you think of this play as far as a general impression goes? With us, Daryl. Sorry, mm -hmm. I am now. I just said I was taking a second. Um, I, I did enjoy the play. There was a lot of um different symbols for the fence. You know, you can see it as the fences he was locked within in jail, the fences of or the gates of heaven, and the fence he was building the whole play. And you know, there's just those reoccurring themes and stories just they're there's something I always enjoy seeing I, I don't know why but it's just you know just something neat that I really enjoy um the play itself was good and I don't think that I um was called on to speak any on the last one either but I enjoyed it as well I sort of agreed with what you said that it was uh, a breath of fresh air to get sort of a, a smaller play that just is a bit bite-sized instead of a really long uh play to read but yeah, I enjoyed both of them. Um, I, I guess I'll go further in depth as we go through different questions, but I really enjoyed the reoccurring symbols. Um, the characters all had different and multiple layers to them, it felt like, and um, yeah. Yeah, even, even this play, it's, it's kind of long but it doesn't feel like it like it reads a lot faster i think compared to some of this earlier stuff we've read like i got through this today in a couple sittings so um, yeah it's it's much more i think it's much more relatable to us than some of the other stuff we've been reading um, Josh, you said you enjoyed this one. What did you uh, find intriguing about it? Uh, I liked the I liked the uh, fo focus on the uh, family. Like uh, the the uh, the uh, play to me is more about learning to uh, learning to let go of the bad bad things in the past to uh, learn to forgive others for the bad things that happened to them. So to me, I so. So for me, I really enjoyed that message. Yeah, that's that's a great theme. Um, you definitely see that at the end when um, Corey is trying to let go of his um, all the bad things that happened between him and his dad. Um, like Corey says that he's not going to go to the funeral. And Rose is like, what's she talking about? You're not going to go to the funeral. That's your father, right? So, like, you, you could kind of make the argument Corey is also one of the main characters because, um, like, 
especially if you think that that's kind of a, a main theme, forgiveness. Or, of course, Rose, too, right? Rose has to uh, kind of suck up the fact that her husband was unfaithful to her. Rose, Rose is almost a saint, if you ask me, right? She, she raises his baby with another woman because the kid's mother died. So, you know, Ro Rose is, uh, you know, she's, she's a better person than me, right? You know, if I was in that situation, I don't know if I'd do that. So um, forgiveness, you know, we got, we got race and forgiveness. These are two good main themes so far. What about uh, what about you, Faith? What did you make of this one? Um, I agree with what Josh said about um, the themes being important. I really liked the oh god, what's it called? Oh, the perspective of race. I like that a lot, especially. Yeah, so you kind of like the, the theme of like how race might be holding maybe Troy and all the others back. Yeah, that's, um, you know, this, this might be a good way to dive into character analysis, but um We'll see what some of the rest of you guys feel like first. Shayla, what do you, Shayla, what do you think of this one? I really enjoyed it. Um, speaking on the theme of race, um, you know, the American dream, immigrants came over to America for the American dream, but the American dream was not made for people of color, for people, um, for minorities. Right. Yeah, I mean, just just read your history books there, right? Like, um, yeah, it was it was most. It depends what you consider a minority, I guess. Like, if you lots of Europeans immigrated over, and people like the Irish were looked down upon. So, um, like. Especially in the 1800s, the Irish were looked down upon just as just favorably as as other races. But um, but yeah, like it, there's a certain when that dream was developed. I think it's hard to argue the shade of that uh, that wasn't for a specific subgroup. White men, right? Yeah, this. This was a complicated discussion. Um, we almost could use a historian to help us out. But um, even slavery was a complicated thing, right? You had you did have some free black people in America who owned other slaves. So it was it's sometimes it's a more of a complicated discussion than we think it is. But um and nonetheless, we can kind of see, I think you're exactly right, that these early ideas of work hard, if you work hard, you can get that big house, right? You can have a big family, you can you can succeed as long as you work hard. Right? I think you're right to point out that that's a, that that came about from white people, right, more so. Not to say that today we can't expand that dream to, to be more widely encompassing, but um, yeah, this, this is something that Troy's wrestling with in the play, right? He's trying to get a piece of the dream and um, how successful is he at it? Um, a very, very good point. Lily, what about yourself? What did you what did you make of this one? 
I locked it. It's like everybody else. Uh, I liked it where it's just something like everyday life that we live and it's not, <laughs> you know, like Shakespeare and stuff, but I enjoyed it. Right. Yeah. So it kind of feels just the fact that it's much closer to our present moment. It's a little more relatable, perhaps. Yeah. Ben, I don't know if your mic's still working over there. Uh, what did you think of this one? Um, I liked it. Uh, pretty much everyone's taken what I said. But, um, yeah, I agree with Michelle. I think that's who said it. But America wasn't really made for minorities, mainly for like, the white man. Right, so... Um... A big part of the struggle, especially the civil rights struggle, was trying to figure this out. Um, Wilson says that he was, of course, whenever you think about the civil rights movement, how you had the two major voices. Of course, you had the voices like Martin Luther King. He encouraged like passive resistance, and passive protest. Then you had the protests of people like Malcolm X, right? Malcolm X was more of the, let's almost be militant about this. Let's fight. Like even if we, even if we have to take it to the streets, right? Let's fight for our rights. Like this passive stuff's all well and good, but we're not going to get what we did, what we are owed until we seize it. And, um, we still we see this even today, even in our country today, right? We've how many race riots have we seen in the past um, few years? Quite a bit, quite a bit, right? Um, and just I don't I don't think there's been that many in the past couple of years, but especially during the last presidential administration, there was a ton of them. I remember Baltimore. Um, of course, if you remember when um, um, the, the incident with the cop choking, what was, again, I, my brain's working slow. What, what was that kid's name? You guys remind me. What was that kid's name who was choked out by the cop? Uh, you're thinking of George Floyd? George Floyd, right. George Floyd. Yeah, there was lots of race riots after that just because um, that case was... I mean, I, I don't want to get too political here. I, it's hard not to when you talk about this subject, but uh, it's hard to argue that George Floyd wasn't murdered because of racial reasons. Right? Uh, that was that was an excessive use of force. So, um, yeah, the the conflicts between police officers and the black community. Like that, that's a complicated subject. Um, there's been lots of shooting, like lots of shootings, lots of incidents that were probably unwarranted. So, um, again, a very complicated subject. Um, this is a subject that I would definitely like to get, especially if we're going to talk about this. This is a subject I would actually like to get a law enforcement officer's perspective on. I actually know a former, I taught a student who's a, who's now a policeman. I might get her perspective on this, see what she has to say. Josh, I know before your dad went into academics, he was a policeman. He would probably offer us some good perspective too. Uh, yes, he, 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 he used to be, he used to be a police officer. Uh, I believe he also taught criminal justice before, so he, yeah. he would know. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to definitely. definitely he, he also he also wrote a doctorate on the uh, subject, so he he know, he knows better than anyone. You know, that's that's his uh, that's his wheelhouse. Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't I didn't know that's what he did his doctorate on. So very cool. So. Um, Well, this is, a, this is a good chance to dive now into 
character analysis. You know, we got to start with Troy. Right. Um, how did you guys feel about Troy? He's he's very clearly a conflicted character here. He's not. He's definitely not a benevolent character. He's not all good. He's got lots of good to him. He's got lots of evil to him. Um, perhaps he's been warped by the society in many ways. If you guys have, how did you guys feel about him? Were you sympathetic to him? Were you maybe repulsed by him? Like he, he acts pretty awfully to his kid and his wife for sure, right? He cheats on her. He's very hard on a stepkid, Corey. And he, of course, the argument is maybe Troy's trying to teach him accountability, like, hey, you need to also work while you play on the football team. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe he's trying to do like tough love. But um, let's characterize Troy. What did you guys think of, um, of of his character? What was your thoughts, feelings about him? Michelle, you you look like you got something on the edge of your of your tongue there. So we'll start with you. I did feel empathy for him. I'm just a very sympathetic person. I always try to see like every perspective, but I definitely think he has a lot of generational trauma, which is probably why he acts that way towards his children because of the way he was treated by his father. Yeah, that, that's a pretty uh, crazy passage, right? When he talks about what his dad did, and, uh, his dad was very violent to him. And um, it's pretty graphic in that one part. He talks about how uh, when he was a teenage boy, right, he was, I guess he was having sex with a girl his age, right? His dad came and beat him off of him, off of her. And then his dad um, tried to force himself on this girl in his stead. And uh, he tried to stand up and... Um, he was violently beaten by, by his father. That's what he said. That's when he moved out. So, so yeah, now he's now this type of conflict showing up with how he treats Corey. So, um, yeah, gener the generational trauma. That's a that's a very good point. That that passage. That's that's a horrible passage. Like that's yeah. You, you can kind of tell maybe that screwed him up in many ways. Daryl, what about you? What did you think of uh, Troy? What was your thoughts? I can agree with Michelle that I, I did partially feel sympathy for him. And I feel like that a lot of what he did and his actions were caused by his past experiences, past trauma. And there was a lot of stuff that he'd went through, but it is kind of hard to root for the guy. You know, he's very, mm -hmm. he's, he's very rude to his kid. He's, he's definitely not a very good husband or, or is it a girlfriend? I'm really not sure if they're married or not. I'm, I'm pretty sure they are. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And then he ends up cheating on her and has a kid with someone else. And it's just, you know, he isn't, he isn't exactly seeming like he's too sorry about it for parts of it. But whenever it comes to raising his kid, maybe he's just going by what he feels is right because that's how his dad raised him, you know. And then, and then he spent a lot of years in prison. There was just a lot of things that went very unfortunately in his life. So I do feel sympathetic towards him and feel like it's not all fully his fault or that he doesn't sometimes know any way better, at least for the parenting part. But it is still kind of hard to appreciate him and be like you know that's my favorite character because you know you kind of don't want to say anything to, uh kind, too kind about someone who does such bad things throughout the story and if if anything if i had to build on your comment there daryl let's say this makes 
this arguably makes Troy one of the most human characters we've studied in this class. Like, um, he's not an ideal sketch or a portrait. Um, just the fact that he has does have so many complexities. He's he's a great he's a great psychological study. I think just just as much so as Hamlet, I would argue. Both of them have a lot going on, um, shaping their faults and behaviors. So um, I was. I'm going to go back to the round table here. It's easier for me to keep up with that way. There's the round table view. Um, Savannah, what about what about you? What would you add to this discussion of Troy? I'm sorry, I sent you a message. I don't know if you got it or not. <clears throat> My Wi-Fi and stuff went out for a hot minute there, so I've been gone for like 20 minutes trying to fix it. Like I don't know if like somebody hit a power pole near me or what. Yeah, I've had a trouble out of my internet here at my apartment in Beckley, too. It's been going in and out. So I'm glad it hasn't today. I got Frontier. <laughs> we got Sudden Link here in Beckley. That's not too much better. The question I asked was, what, how did you feel about the character Troy? Like, were you... Um, like, he's, he's obvious. He's got a lot going on. Um, we talked about how he's like a victim of generational trauma, but he also does bad stuff himself. Like, uh, how did, what was your general thoughts and emotions on the character? Um, I'll be honest. I don't have any general thoughts on him. Um, I remember. I think I heard you say a question in the beginning, like before you started going around, talking about like how is it more about race or about um, class? What word was it social or class? Life. Yeah, and you said, or if it was like a little bit of both. I will go off of that more or less, but. Uh, <clears throat> I feel like he definitely could have broke the gener generational trauma. I know that's one thing I'm trying to do at least. Uh, and a lot of my uh, generation were trying to break that, I know of. Um, but as for like, if it's based on race or social class, I think it's actually a little bit of both. More social class than race because I have seen a mixture of very white poor people very rich poor people I grew up in a neighborhood with where I was the minority I mean I've seen a little bit of both ways I've had family members who had their whole world handed to them and um for exhibit my mom <laughs> Like she had their whole world handed to her, had money, could go wherever she wanted, do whatever she wanted with her life. And she turned to the bad side of it. She turned into drugs and misused it because of her generational trauma. I feel like it takes a little bit of both. I think it depends on the person. Maybe, maybe even the setting, right? Like, where is this person? Maybe. Yes and no, honestly, just for the simple fact of um, my mom. I'm just using her for reference comparison. Um, she actually grew up in a home. Her father was a coal miner. Her mother was a bit protective for her situation, but she definitely could have done better and even for instance if I use from somebody from my school I watched girls who I grew up with their families they had the best mother and father and they still took it and misused it and ended up doing way worse
Yeah, I'm glad you raised that point, Savannah, about social class versus race. Um, this is a big dividing question today, especially in politics. Um, this 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 question has kind of divided the Democratic Party in, in our country. Um, if you guys remember a couple of years ago when Hillary Clinton was running against Bernie right before uh, Trump won back in 2016. Um, when Hillary Clinton was running against Bernie, Bernie was cleaning those. If you remember back from that primary, Bernie was cleaning the race early. Like they were, um, they were, of course, those early states like Iowa and New Hampshire, like where they have all those caucuses. Bernie was cleaning those states up. He had a sizable lead over her. But as soon as um, it got to the southern states, where there was a predominantly black community, more especially within the Democratic Party of voters, Bernie started getting destroyed. Well, um, a lot of that was due to this race versus class discussion. Bernie argued that um, a lot of the inequalities we have in our country today are based off of class. Right? He's always talking about how billionaires have all the money and all the rest of us are just kind of trying to pick up the pieces. Bernie's kind of got that um, social class message. Hillary, on the other hand, had more of a race message. You know, she kind of, she was like, no, that a lot of the injustices aren't because of class and because of race. And um, well, her message definitely resonated more with the African-American community because she overwhelmingly won pretty much all those southern states. And that's what caused her to get the nomination, more or less. It was a that was a tough primary. That was one I followed with great interest at the time. And, um, but yeah, Bernie did not resonate with the black vote. Maybe that was because they just didn't buy into his message. So it's a it's a very interesting and complex subject for sure. We're going to dive into how this works with Troy. You know, we'll just think about it. I mean, his bait uh, the place called fences. So here's another fence, right? The baseball. The base, all the baseball stuff in the play. And Troy, Troy's always talking about how great of a baseball player he was. And he, like he says, I'm. He says this guy in the Yankees, he's he's kind of crap, right? He's, he plays second base and he's only batting two sixty nine. Right? I was batting three thirty and had all these home runs in the Negro leagues. Of course, this was a this was a time period in big. I'm a I'm a huge baseball nerd, but this is a huge this was a period of time with baseball where it was even baseball was segregated. Right? Before Jackie Robinson broke the collar barrier. They talk about Jackie Robinson in here, but before he broke the collar barrier, um, the rate the game was segregated into white and black pretty much. And some of the greatest players to ever play, like Satchel Paige, um, he was part of those Negro Leagues. I think Bob Gibson was one, another great pitcher. Um, Jeff, of course, Jackie Robinson was a Hall of Famer because he was a good player. He didn't just break the color barrier. He was also a fantastic player, MVP for the Brooklyn Dodgers. But... Um, Troy's making this argument too, like, hey, I would, if I was playing Major League Baseball, like I was meant to do, that's my great skill. Like, I would probably be like a famous and a Hall of Fame. Right? But um, just because he happened to be born with that with race, um, he's held down. 
Like he's held down to that lower league, the Negro leagues, which um, until recently, like recent baseball history, a lot of those players who are in the Negro leagues actually have now finally made it to the Hall of Fame and stuff. But it took how many years? 70, 80 for a lot of them to make it. So but he's he's saying, hey, one of the great lines on the play, I think, is when he says, hey, um, my kid is, my kid's struggling to, I'm struggling to put flows on my kid's back. I bet that guy who plays second baseman for the Yankees, I bet he, I bet his kid doesn't struggle, doesn't, I bet that guy doesn't struggle to get clothing for his kids. Right, so he's kind of pointing out how, uh, there's lots of systematic things that are working against the black community. And um, well, maybe that maybe that's more obvious in that time period, right? Than, than maybe it is today with segregation and stuff. But um, you know, that's that's I love the baseball stuff in the play because that that's pretty much his best example of how he's being held down. Um, I don't know if any, any of you guys want to build on on that um, thoughts on like you you feel like he's right that um, there's a certain wall that he can reach after that he can't go no higher. think well maybe maybe not if I had to answer my own question maybe maybe not like Jackie Robinson broke the barrier right he uh he transcended those things so um maybe you can make the argument Troy's just making excuses for his own failures right I, I think that that's a legitimate argument um, He's, he's whining, he's making excuses. Like, um, I think that's a valid argument if any of you guys see him that way. Josh, I'll, I'll get back to you. What did you think of Troy? Hmm, I kind of agree with what you said uh, about Troy making excuses. And there was, there, there was a person who... Uh, who I called him out for it. I think it was Rose who who said it had more to do with his age than it actually than it than it did with his race. Uh, so uh, I think you could you could definitely make the case that it that he's just making excuses and just just using the most convenient way to to uh, attribute his failures to. Right, he's he's so old and bitter and broken down, right? That he's that he'll blame anything, right? He'll play that card. Now here's a question. Here's a question for you guys. Why does he cheat on his wife? Why? What makes him cheat? Like what? What do you what do you think makes him cheat on her? They seem happy for the first whole half of the play, but then, but then uh, we find out that he's a dirty cheater. Um, let's see if I can find the passage for page fourteen thirteen. Why did it, why did he cheat? What drove him to cheat? Um, what do what do you guys think about this question? What drove him to cheat on his wife? He had a, he had a, he tried to justify it logically. Um, of course, can you justify something like that? What, what did you all think of that? What do you think of this question? Why did he cheat? I'll call on you, Faith. I, I know you probably have a answer to this question. What, what did you, why do you think made him cheat? 
I really don't have an answer to this question. Scratching my head at this. I, again, they seem to be in a kind of loving relationship. Um, let's see if I can find the passage. I'll ground us in the text. Let's see. This is when he's talking the lines about it. When he's actually talking to his wife about it. Didn't he say it was because he he was just in the same spot for so many years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was just tired. He just wanted something new. Yeah, you're exactly right, Shayla. That's that's a summary. That's pretty much a nice summary of what he said. That uh, he has. This doesn't even have anything to do with the race stuff, right? He says that he. In his marriage, he feels so many responsibilities. Right? He has to go to work. He has to provide for these children. So Corey, Corey not even being his own child, right? He has to uh, do all this stuff. He has to go work, provide for the children. Like he, his family life is um, is stressful. Right. That's pretty much what he says. Yeah. He, and while he was with the other woman, he didn't have to think about anything else. He didn't have to think about any of his responsibilities. Right. Well, now, now that we hashed out that, like, that, that's exactly what the text says. Um, what do you guys think of that? You, you think this is uh, nonsense? Nonsense reasoning? Yeah. Right. So some people you some people go to alcohol, some people go to drugs. He went to infidelity. So yeah, right. to me it, it 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 yeah, it's 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 bad. Yeah, there's there's no there's no justifying it, right? There's there's no justifying. He tries, he tries to rationalize it. The way that Rose handles it. Right, like again, I think I think the woman's a saint in the play, right? She's she handles it pretty well. I love yeah, the she's, she's great. I love the line that she that she gives them. I think it's um yeah, it's right after it's in Act Two. It's right after um he brings the baby home after his after his um, mistress dies in childbirth. And, um, yeah, the, the line something to the effect of, um, hey, uh, I'll raise this kid, but you're now a womanless man. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, yeah, that, that was a pretty good burn on her part. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's quite a zinc. That's what I think that's exactly what I wrote in my book, Josh. Ouch. Right. <laughs> but um tying this whole thing back full circle with Troy, right? Josh, I think you said it best earlier when you said the please kind of uh, big things for kidness, right? Um it seems to me like everybody is able to forgive in the play. Rose forgives for what he did. She's actually now raising this this young child in middle age at that. That's, um, Corey forgives. The whole relationship between Troy and Corey is also interesting. Um, let's 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 dive. In, let's go there. Um, do you do you guys of course the whole relationship Corey's a star football player he's going to have a college come and give him a scholarship right um, but Troy's like hey you need to go get a job and work at the grocery store that's more important than her scholarship 
maybe maybe Corey could have done both. Maybe Corey is making excuses too. But um, the argument Corey raises the argument against Troy. Uh, Troy's jealous, right? Troy was a star athlete in his time, but maybe that wall was holding him back. Now that that wall is starting to fade a little bit, right? Now that that fence is starting to open, now Troy wants to keep Corey from going over the fence. Right? Troy's maybe trying to hold him back where he'll live the same life as Troy. So uh, the generational trauma thing is definitely coming up here too. Um, yeah, as I see you nodding, Shayla. Do you, feel, do you feel like Troy's selfishly holding Corey back in his dreams? I do. Troy, he tries to paint it as he's trying to protect Corey. But in the end, we know that it's out of jealousy because he didn't get to live his dream. And he's seen his son kind of as himself. And he, yeah, he's jealous that he didn't get to have that. Which is a horrible thing, right? Like, why would you hold your kid back just because you didn't get to? But there's that old adage, like, you want your kid to live a better life than you did. Maybe not truly. Maybe he does, at the same time he doesn't. It's, it's complicated. What do you make of that one, Daryl? Do you feel like... Uh, he was uh, jealous of his own kid. It did sort of feel like it. Well, maybe not the, the jealousy part, but it definitely seemed like he was holding him back. Jealousy, I'm not really mm -hmm. too positive about, but I know that, you know, he, he did seem to want to force his ideas upon him. Like, you know, stop playing football. You have to, you have to play baseball because I did. And then you have to get a job and make money. He, he because of... I guess what he was trying to do is sort of make it more like him, but because he had so much trauma and baggage, I guess, going on, that it sort of was bringing him down instead of making them have more to talk about. You know, a lot of dads, are, they tend to not, not only want better for their kids, but they want their kids to have similarities with them. And sometimes those similarities can be things that the kid doesn't want, like a certain sport to play or a certain job and you know that they, they, they still just really try to press it on to them which can just lead to both the parent and the kid having a worse time yeah that, that sounds uh that sounds like my childhood daryl so uh, I, I think you summed it up right <laughs> yeah I, I was this nerdy kid and my dad wanted me to be a star athlete but um yeah, so, uh, yeah. My, my dad sort of wished for the same thing, but I sort of, me and him came to a mutual agreement that I'd play football for one year, and if I liked it, I liked it. If I didn't, I didn't. So I was willing to do that much, but, you know, I, I, I had, I kind of had the same nerdy thing going on, too. <laughs> yeah. By the time I bro my brother is way nerdier than me. So uh, by the time my brother came around, I think my dad had just given up on all his hopes and dreams. Like now he's now he's wishing I had a kid myself. So maybe maybe the dream can continue. Um, but uh, yeah, generational trauma. Right? I'm, I'm exposing you guys to mine. So um, yeah, this. One of the great scenes is at the end, right? Cole, like, um, Troy's drunk. He's sitting on the porch, and uh, Corey wants to walk by him. Troy's like, shouldn't you say please, right, to walk by me? I own this house. I paid for it. You're just a, I just, you just live here because I'm so kind and generous. Right. Then um, they get into this. Of course, come to find out, Troy's not he didn't even buy the house with his own money. He got it because of his brother. 
So that there's a layer of hypocrisy there. But um, they get into the standoff. Corey kind of stands up to him. But then Corey, when he has the chance, doesn't let his anger out, right? Corey kind of controls it. And um, I think that says a lot about Corey, right? That, um, again, the whole forgiveness thing, right? That he's, even in that tough of a moment, he's still not, he still won't sort of strike his own father, right? Um, that respect is still there, even even when it's even when the respect's at its lowest, there's still respect. So, uh, yeah, I think that says a lot about his integrity. Um, I view I view Corey pretty favorably. Maybe that's just because of my own experiences that I just mentioned. I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what else. Yeah, to get back to what I was saying before I went on this tangent about Corey, like the whole generation, like forgiveness, right? everybody seems to forgive. Lines is kind of an interesting case study too. Right? He's the musician. Like Lines is kind of living his, his own life, right? He's not letting Troy or anybody else tell him what to do. Troy's always like, you're a darn bum. You always come here wanting $10 every week. You know, I never see you unless unless you're bumming money off me, right? Lyons, Lyons always takes it in stride, though, right? He, he never gets upset with Troy. He's like, no, nah, man, that's not why I'm here. Here to see you. He kind of, he kind of puts up with Troy's pestering. Like, um, he kind of just brushes it off. So... Um, Lyons maybe has even more to be angry about than Corey, right? Lyons was raised alone by his mother. Troy's like three different women's baby daddy here, right? So uh, Lyons is his first, but um, Lyons is paving his own way, not letting anybody tell him what to do. Well, so, yeah. Very good play, guys. Very good. Um, this is actually the first time I've taught either one of these plays. So um, tonight was a very interesting experience for me. I taught this theater class completely online last year. And, um, well, we had discussion posts. But you guys know how that goes. You don't learn anything from doing discussion posts. Right? So, um yeah, I feel like I feel like this was a good experience teaching both these plays for the first time. So, death of a salesman next time that will also be a first. I've never taught that one in a live setting. It was also I also taught that one online, but not in a live setting. So, and that will be a good way to end the class. Death of a salesman's a lot more experimental. Like it'll. When I talked about modernism earlier, I talked about experimentation, how they like to experiment with form. That play's not really a direct linear play from beginning to end. When you guys read Death of a Salesman, it skips a lot back and forth between different moments in time. And you'll have to kind of piece together what's going on. Like how far ahead did we jump? How far back did we jump? So that play, that play doesn't have a linear structure. It it kind of goes back. Yes, sometimes you'll watch movies and they'll just skip back and forth, right? That's kind of how Death of a Salesman reads. It does, I see your look of discontent, Shayla. That, that that's not your that's not your style. I'm guessing. And then maybe Arthur Miller will change your mind. Maybe, maybe he'll change it. Uh, maybe, but uh, that's a good play to end the class on. I think when it comes to experimental writers, there's either give you Arthur Miller or give you Samuel Beckett. And uh, trust me, if you read Samuel Beckett, you would thank me for giving you 
um, Arthur Miller instead. Uh, Samuel Beckett's so far out there that he's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. Um, so, um, yeah, if, if you knew, you would thank me for assigning you Arthur Miller instead. So, um, so, yeah, good class, guys, good class. So, again, just real quick, over the break, I'll get you those papers back, the those, those second short ones. And I'll also try to get you a prompt up for the last short one. So um, you can knock that out of the way, okay? So, but yeah, I'll be sending those back. I'll send those back next week some point just because I'm so bogged down in other stuff right now. But I'll get to those, get you your grades on those. So um, I think after that, that's really it as far as, besides your final paper, which we talked about several weeks ago, that's it as far as um, writing goes. So three short papers, your participation in class, your final paper, your presentation, and the writing workshops. We'll do a couple more of those writing workshops in the final weeks too. I need, the reason why I haven't done it yet is I need to write quiz questions and stuff. So, um, but yeah, we'll do, I'll give you guys a couple more of those in the final weeks too. That way you'll have at least five or six grades in that category. But um, I'll have a lot more, I'll have a lot more, uh, I'll get stuff back to you guys a lot faster and stuff once uh, the break's over because you guys will be my sole focus. I won't be teach Right now I'm teaching um, eight different classes. So uh, my brain is frazzled. So yeah, I will, I will be more, uh, I'll give you guys more attention after the break. So appreciate your patience with me. It's, sometimes it takes me a while, but not because I'm lazy, it's because I'm bogged down. But um, it was a pleasure, guys, as always. You guys are always one of the highlights of my week. So um, if, if, I, if I don't hear from any of you guys, take care. You all have a wonderful Thanksgiving break. Try to rest. Try to collect yourselves before the final stretch. Okay, so I'll see you guys two weeks from today, in the 29th, when we will talk about death of a salesman. Lily, you will be our final presenter. So uh, I will look forward to that. Everybody's presenting but you now. So. Okay. Last but not least. Last but <laughs> not least. Yeah. So, Thank you. Have a good, have a good Thanksgiving break. You guys too. I'll see you guys on the other end. Have a good oh, before I go, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that the uh, Dropbox for uh, the final paper, I don't, I don't see it on Brightspace, so I just thought I'd bring that up before I go. Okay, um, I'll have a look, Josh. Especially if you want to turn it in early or something, I'll have a look so you can get. Um, post it. I'll right. see. I'll see if I posted it. All right. Thank you. Well, Have a good evening, everybody. See you guys.